Hello everyone, I am Lynn Clark and I make code cartoons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also work at Mozilla. I'm in the Emerging Technologies group there. So that's things like the Rust programming language and um, other things like WebAssembly, which I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so if you're a JavaScript developer, I don't know how many of you are JavaScript developers in here. Okay, we got a few of you in here. If you're a JavaScript developer, or even if not, you may have noticed that there's a lot of hype about WebAssembly right now. People talk about how blazingly fast it is. Now it's going to completely revolutionize the way that we develop for the web. But a lot of the conversations around that, they don't go into the details about what it is about WebAssembly that makes it fast. And I know when I hear that kind of rhetoric, but I don't hear any details to back it up, my inner skeptic comes out. So in this talk, I want to help you understand what exactly it is about WebAssembly that makes it fast and what circumstances it is fast. But first, what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a way to run programming languages other than JavaScript on web pages. It also works in Node, but I'll be talking mostly about the browser today. In the past, when you wanted to run code on a web page, your only option was JavaScript. So if you wanted to run a calculation, uh, to change the DOM in response to some kind of user interaction. You would use JavaScript to do that. But with WebAssembly, other languages will be able to do these things too. So when people say that WebAssembly is fast, what they're comparing it to is JavaScript. That's the apples to apples comparison. Now I don't want to imply that it's an either or situation, that you're either using WebAssembly or you're using JavaScript. In fact, we expect that people using WebAssembly are going to continue to use JavaScript in the same application. But it is useful to compare the two so that you can understand what this improved performance of code running on the web could mean. In order to understand this, let's look a little bit at the history of performance of code running on the web. So JavaScript was created in 1995, and it wasn't designed to be fast. There are a number of features in JavaScript that make it hard to make JavaScript fast. So things like dynamic types, where you have a variable that could be a string or it could be a number, and you don't really know until runtime. And even at runtime, it could be changing. But these features also make it easy to get up and running with JavaScript pretty quickly. So JavaScript developers just accepted this trade-off. They accepted that their code would run a little slow because the trade-off was worth it. For the first decade of JavaScript, this was true. JavaScript was pretty slow. Then the browser started getting more competitive. In about 2008, this thing started called the Performance Wars, where browser vendors started making their JavaScript engines much faster. The technique that they used to do this was introducing JIT, just-in-time compilers, to the JS engine. And I'll explain what these do later. But for now, let's look at the impact that these JIT compilers had. With the introduction of these JITs, you see an inflection point in the performance of JavaScript, of code running on the web. All of a sudden, the execution of JavaScript was about 10 times faster, and these performance improvements continued over the next decade. With this improved performance, you start seeing JavaScript being used for things that you wouldn't have expected, so things like Node and Electron. And these new applications are possible because of this increase in performance, it's because of this inflection point that we had 10 years ago, that we're seeing the kinds of JavaScript applications that we see today. That's why it is interesting that we may be approaching another one of these inflection points in the speed of code running on the web with WebAssembly. And this is where I need to start backing up with what I'm saying with some details. To do this, I need to explain a little bit about where JavaScript spends its time today. So here's a diagram of where the JS engine spends its time for a hypothetical app. And this isn't showing an average. It, you know, any particular app would look different from this. But we can use this to build up a mental model. And you may have seen diagrams like this one before and notice that this one looks a little bit different. Um, for this one, I've combined some of the categories that you typically see so that you have a smaller set. So these categories are parsing, compiling, and optimizing the code re-optimizing the code, executing the code, and garbage collection. 
Now let's look at what this diagram would look like for WebAssembly instead of JavaScript. You'll notice that some of these bars are shorter and some are missing. In this talk, I want to explain how WebAssembly changes the amount of time that the engine spends in these tasks. But first, let's look at where JavaScript's engines have spent the time, would have spent the time before the JIT compiler. In the early days of JavaScript, the diagram would have looked more like this. So there would be parsing, running the code, and then garbage collection. What made that execution bar shorter, what made it run faster, was the introduction of that JIT. The JIT considerably reduced the amount of time it took to execute JavaScript by adding a little bit of overhead, by doing a little bit of extra work. Now with WebAssembly, we want to make these bars even smaller. And in order to see how to do that, we're going to need to dive in to the work that the JIT actually does. So I'm going to run through a quick crash course in just-in-time compilers. And this is a general overview. The different engines have different architectures, and they've changed over time. But most of this is true for most of them. And this may be review for some of you, but it's going to be quick. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about this. So when you're developing, you have a goal and a problem. The goal is that you want to communicate to the machine what it should do. And the problem is that you speak a human language, and the machine speaks a machine language. You don't speak the same languages. Even if you don't think about your programming language as a human language, it really is. It's been designed for human cognition, not for machine cognition. I think of this like the movie Arrival, where you have humans and aliens who are trying to talk to each other. It's not as easy as translating word for word from one language to the other, because the two groups actually have different ways of thinking about the world. And that's true for humans and machines, too. I'll explain more about the differences in the way that we think later, but let's look at this process of translating. In programming, there are generally two different ways of translating. You can use an interpreter or a compiler. With an interpreter, the translation happens pretty much line by line on the fly. A compiler, on the other hand, doesn't translate on the fly. It takes time ahead of time to create that translation and to write it down. There are pros and cons to each of these ways of handling the translation. So for an interpreter, some of the pros are it's quick to get up and running. You don't have to go through that whole compilation step before you can start running your code. You just start running that first line. An interpreter seems like a natural fit for something like JavaScript, where you want to be able to get the developer up and running quickly. And so that's why, in the beginning, browsers just use JavaScript interpreters. But the trade-off is, if you're in something like a loop, where the same code is running over and over again, you have the same trans translation costs over and over again. The compiler has opposite trade-offs. It takes a little bit more time to st start up, because it has to go through that compilation at the beginning. But then you don't incur that translation cost in loops when you're running the same code over and over again. Another difference is that interpreters are working during runtime, as the code is running. You can't take, you know, they don't have the liberty to take additional time to think about how the machine thinks and what the best translation for that machine would be. But since compilers are working ahead of time, they can take that extra time and think about what the optimal version of this translation is for the particular machine that they're running on and how that machine thinks. And this is called optimization. To get the best of both of these worlds, browsers started mixing compilers in. They added a new part to the JavaScript engine called a monitor or a profiler. The monitor watches code as it runs. It keeps track of things like how often the code is run. And at first, the monitor just runs everything through the interpreter and keeps track of these things. If it sees the same function being run a few times, that function is called warm. And when a function gets warm, the JIT will send it off to be optimized, to be, or sorry, to be compiled by the baseline compiler. The baseline compiler is going to start making a compiled version of the function. And it's going to do this in chunks. Each operation of the function is compiled into one or more stubs. So for example, the plus equal sign, which most of you probably can't see, but there's sum plus equals array item i. So for that plus equal sign, that's an operation. The compiler would create a stub for that. 
And that stub would be specific to whatever types are being used when it's compiled. So if sum and the array element are integers, this stub is going to compile to integer addition. Now, if the monitor hits that operation again with the same variable types, it will just pull out its compiled version. And if it hits that operation again with different variable types, it will create another stub and store it. It will have both of those stubs in the baseline compiler. As the code runs, more and more baseline stubs are added. And that saves on translation time and helps speed things up. But like I said, there's more that a compiler can do. It can spend some time figuring out what the most efficient way to do things is to make these optimizations. Now, the baseline compiler makes some of these optimizations, but it doesn't want to take too much time because it doesn't want to hold up execution of the code too long. However, if the code is really hot, if, if a particular part of the code is being run a whole bunch of times, then it's worth taking the extra time to make more optimizations. So when a part of the code is very hot, the monitor will send it off to the optimizing compiler. This will create another, even faster version of that function that will be stored. In order to make a faster version of the code, the optimizing compiler has to make some assumptions. For example, if you can assume that all objects created by a particular constructor have, uh, constructor have the same shape, that is that they always have the same properties and those properties are always added in the same order, then it can cut some corners based on that. So the optimizing compiler uses information that the monitor has gathered to make these judgments. If something has been true for all of the previous passes through a loop, the compiler assumes it will continue to be true. But of course, with JavaScript, there are never any guarantees. You could have 99 objects that all have the same shape, but then the 100th might be missing a property. So the compiled code needs to check before it runs to see whether its assumptions are valid. If they are, then that optimized compiled code runs. But if not, the JIT assumes that it made the wrong assumptions, and it trashes that <coughs> optimized code. And then execution goes back to the interpreter or the baseline compiler. This process is called deoptimization or bailing out. Now, usually optimizing compilers make code faster, but sometimes they can cause unexpected performance problems. If you have code that keeps getting optimized and then deoptimized back and forth, it can actually end up being slower than just executing the baseline compiled version. So a lot of JITs will keep track of how many times they've tried to optimize a particular function. And if it's tried too many times, it will just mark it as don't even try to optimize this. So that is the JIT in a nutshell. Code starts off running in an interpreter, and a monitor collects information about it. Then it sends off to be compiled, depending on how often that part of the code is executed, first to the baseline compiler and then to the optimizing compiler. Now that we understand more about the work that the JS engine is doing, let's look at ways to help it go faster. One way is to get rid of some of this overhead. We could move some of it ahead of time. But to do that, we would need to get rid of dynamic types. If we're going to be optimizing ahead of time, we need those types to be explicit in the code, because we aren't going to be monitoring it at runtime to see what those types are. So these dynamic types that can change at runtime are a problem. But I already suggested that that's part of what made JavaScript successful. These dynamic types help developers get up and running quickly. Why would you want to change something that made JavaScript successful? I want to be clear here. We don't actually need to change anything in JavaScript to get the benefits of WebAssembly. But there is a change that's already happening and has happened in JavaScript that we can take advantage of. And that is the move towards modularity. So over the past years, both with NPM and with the ES2015 module spec, JavaScript has become a much more modularized language. So the nice thing about modules is they provide boundaries. You don't actually need to know about the inner details of what's in the module that you depend on. You just need to know its API. These modules, they could have been compiled ahead of time using a language that doesn't have these flexible types, something like Rust, <laughs> and it won't affect how you code. So take, for example, React, which has a lot of different consumers. The React core team has already been working on performance improvements for the past few years on their reconciliation algorithm. An option for them could be to rewrite their reconciliation algorithm in a language that has types, 
like C or Rust or something like that, and then compile it ahead of time. As long as they keep the API the same, same, consumers of React won't actually notice this when they update their code. The only thing they would notice is the performance improvement. So this is what WebAssembly does. It makes it possible for library developers and application developers to code in languages that are more consistently performant, but then to have the code run on the web just like JavaScript does, and to integrate and communicate with JavaScript. This means that you'll be able to benefit from WebAssembly without having to understand why it's fast. But I think it is more fun when you do know. So I'm going to go ahead and walk you through how it works. And to do this, I'm going to have to give you another crash course, this time in assembly and compilers. I talked about how communicating with the machine is like communicating with an alien. I want to take a look now at how that alien brain works, so how the communication that's coming in is parsed and understood. There's a part of this alien brain that's dedicated to thinking, so things like adding, subtracting, and logic. And there's also a part of the brain that's near there, which is the short-term memory. And these are pretty close together in the same part of the brain. And then there's some longer term memory. So these different parts have names. The part that does the thinking is the arithmetic and logic unit, or the ALU. The short term memory, these are called registers. And they're all encapsulated in the central processing unit. And then the longer term memory, that's random access memory. Each little part of short term memory has a name. And this makes it easy for the brain to figure out which part of its memory it should be using. The sentences in machine communication are called instructions. When one of these instructions comes into the brain, it gets split up into different parts that mean different things. And the way that this instruction gets split up is going to be very specific to the wiring of this brain. For example, this brain might always take the fourth bit through the tenth bit and pipe that into the ALU. And the ALU will figure out, based on what's a 0 and what's a 1 here, um, that it needs to add two things together. And then the brain would take the next two chunks of three bits each to determine which two numbers it should add together. So these would be addresses of registers. You'll see that I've been adding annotations above the machine code here. That makes it easier for us as humans to understand what's going on. And that's actually what assembly is. It's called symbolic machine code. It's a way for humans to be able to read the machine code. You can see here that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the assembly and the machine code for this machine. Something you may have figured out from this is that you can actually have different kinds of assembly for different kinds of machines. Anytime that you have a different architecture inside of a machine, anytime there's a different kind of brain in this machine, there's a good chance that it will have a different kind of assembly. So we're not talking about the target of our translation just being one thing. It's not just one machine code. It's many different kinds of machine code. Just as we speak different languages as people, machines speak different languages. If we were talking human to alien translation, you might be going from English or Russian or Mandarin to alien language A or alien language B. In programming terms, this is like going from C or C++ or Rust to x86 or to ARM. If you want to be able to go from any one of these high-level programming languages down to any one of these assembly languages, you're going to need to create a whole bunch of different translators for each language. And that's going to be pretty inefficient. So what most compilers do is they put at least one layer in between. The compiler will take this high-level programming language and translate it into something that's not quite as high-level, but also isn't working at the level of machine code. And that's called an intermediate representation. So the compiler will take any one of the higher-level languages and translate it to the one intermediate representation. Then from there, another part of the compiler can take that intermediate representation and compile it down to something that's specific for the target architecture. The thing that takes the higher level programming language and translates it to the intermediate representation, that's called a front end. And the thing that goes from the intermediate representation to the target architecture's assembly code, that's called a back end. So now where does WebAssembly fit into this picture? Well, you might think of it as just another one of these target assembly languages, which is kind of true. 
except that each one of those languages corresponds to a particular architecture. But when you're delivering code across the web to be executed on the user's machine, you don't know what the target architecture is. So WebAssembly is a little bit different than usual assembly. It's a machine language for a conceptual machine, not for an actual physical machine. Once the browser downloads the WebAssembly, it can make the short hop between the WebAssembly code and the actual assembly code for the machine that it's running on. So let's walk through the tools that the developer of a library like React would use to make their code WebAssembly. Now, the compiler toolchain that a lot of work has gone into for WebAssembly is called LLVM. There are a number of different front ends and back ends for LLVM. So let's say that we wanted to go from C to WebAssembly. We could take the Clang front end, and that would go from C to the LLVM intermediate representation. Then LLVM could do some optimizations on top of that. Once it's in LLVM's intermediate representation, LLVM knows how it can handle optimizations and takes, takes care of a few little fix-ups. And then there's a back end that's currently in progress that will go from the LLVM intermediate representation to WebAssembly. Uh, and this is actually what Rust is using um, in their WASM unknown unknown target. Now, the LLVM toolchain is still under a little bit of development, so um, there's another toolchain that you might want to try um, called Mscripten that has a fully functioning WebAssembly backend. It uses a fork of LLVM under the hood. And you know, even after the LLVM uh, backend is done, you may still want to use Mscripten because it can be used to pack in some helpful libraries. So things like a file system, which works on top of IndexedDB. But regardless of whether you're using LLVM or Mscripten to get there, the result is a file that ends in .wasm for WebAssembly. This is the WebAssembly module that can be loaded from JavaScript. Right now, the way that it's loaded in JavaScript is a little bit complicated. We're working on making it easier. I'm actually going to be working on uh, turning WebAssembly modules into ES ECMAScript modules um, at the next WebAssembly working group face-to-face. -face. Um, but for now, uh, you can use it with things like Webpack and Parcel. Um, other module loaders are working on support. And plus, as the browsers add built-in module support, WebAssembly modules are going to be loadable that way. So it should be as easy as loading any JavaScript module. When I say that, though, I should add a, add a caveat. Loading the WebAssembly module should be as e easy as loading a JS one, but working with it is going to be a little bit different. So let's say that you're calling a WebAssembly function from JavaScript. And here's the JavaScript function. And here's the one that's been compiled to WebAssembly, or that will be compiled to WebAssembly. Functions in WebAssembly right now can only take WebAssembly types as parameters. And at the moment, that's numbers, so integers or floats. So that's a bit different from regular JavaScript modules. And the same restriction applies to return values. You can only return integers or, or floats. What if you want to return a string? You can't do it. For any data types that are more complex at the moment, you need to put them in web, the WebAssembly module's memory. So this memory is an array buffer. It's just a JavaScript object that simulates a heap. It uh, basically is an array of bytes. The integers that get passed back and forth can be kind of used like pointers into this heap. So the C code can use that to write to memory as if it were an address. And the JavaScript can use that number to figure out which array index to read the data from. Now, it's likely that anybody who's developing a WebAssembly module for web developers is going to create a wrapper around that module. And we actually have a project at Mozilla that we've started, somebody on the Rust team, um, called WASM BindGen, which will automate this process as well. Um, so you're likely never to need to know about this. Once that's in place, you'll just be able to pass strings in and on their way in, the uh, wrapper will figure out like how to put it in memory and pass the right integer. Um, but for now, if you're working with WebAssembly, you do need to know this. So now what I want to go back to is this diagram and look at why WebAssembly is faster. So first off, this isn't shown in the diagram, 
but it can take less time to download WebAssembly because it's more compact. It was designed specifically to be compact. It can be translated into a binary form. So even though gzipped JavaScript is pretty small, the equivalent code in WebAssembly could potentially be smaller. Parsing takes less time than JavaScript too. So JavaScript needs to be parsed from the source into an abstract syntax tree. And then it's usually uh, converted into an intermediate representation called bytecode, which is specific to the engine that it's running in. WebAssembly already is a bytecode. So it just needs to be decoded from the binary version, and decoding is faster than parsing. Compiling takes a lot less time because a lot of it has been done ahead of time, before the file was even pushed up to the server. Plus, the compiler doesn't have to compile multiple stubs for the different types, for all those dynamic types. And you don't get into these optimized and de-optimized cycles that you do with the JIT. Running your code is fast because many of the optimizations that JITs make to JavaScript just aren't necessary with WebAssembly. Plus, the WebAssembly itself uh, provides many instructions that are just faster. Human programmers don't actually need to program it directly because you know, you're usually working in a higher level programming language. So that means that the designers of WebAssembly could make it closer to how the machine thinks. Depending on what kind of work your code is doing, these instructions can run anywhere from 10% to 800% faster. As for garbage collection, at least for now, the languages that are supported use manual memory management. Now, this is likely to change, and I'll explain more about that later. But for now, you don't need to worry about garbage collection. So what is the status of WebAssembly now? So in late February of last year, the browser vendors announced that WebAssembly was ready to ship on by default in the major browsers. Um, we started shipping it on by default in Firefox the next week. Chrome did the same a week later. And then Edge and Safari uh, came later in the year. So all of the major browser vendors support it now. With this, developers can sh start shipping WebAssembly code. And for early versions of browsers that don't support WebAssembly, developers can send down ASM.js. Um, ASM.js was the precursor to WebAssembly, and it's just JavaScript, so it can be run in JavaScript engines. So what's in browsers is the MVP, the minimum viable product. The MVP doesn't contain all of the features that the community group wants to have in there. But with it, WebAssembly is reasonably fast and usable. However, it should get even faster in the future through a combination of fixes in the engines and new features in the spec. So for an example, now these are old slides. As of a week ago, this has been fixed, so I need to update this. Uh, but a fix that did need to happen in Firefox is that uh, currently, or at the time, calling a WebAssembly function in JS code was slower than it needed to be. That's because it had to do something called trampolining. Instead of the j knowing how to deal directly with WebAssembly code, it had to go through this setup function that transferred control from JavaScript to WebAssembly. And that was a lot slower than it was if, if the JIT knew how to handle it directly. So slower is relative. We're only talking like nanoseconds here. Um, so you wouldn't have noticed this overhead if you were passing a single large task off to WebAssembly. But if you had lots of back and forth, you would notice this. But as I said, we recently fixed this. So um, you may see this still in other engines, though. Um, where you have a little bit of slowness in the communication between JavaScript and WebAssembly. As for the spec, there are a number of features that will make things faster. Um, so a feature that's expected reasonably soon is direct DOM access. Currently, there's no way to interact with the DOM directly from WebAssembly, so this means that you can't do something like element inner HTML to update a node from WebAssembly. Instead, you have to go through JS to set that value. Um, so the community group is currently working on adding that direct DOM access. Another feature that is mostly done, but unfortunately not going to land soon, is threading. So one way to speed up code is to make it possible for different parts of the code to run at the same time in parallel. This can sometimes backfire, though, because since the overhead of communication between the threads can take up more time, than the task would have taken in the first place. If you can share memory between threads, though, it reduces this overhead. So 
unfortunately, the thing that we were going to use for the shared memory, shared array buffer, uh, had to be disabled in browsers because of the Spectre bug. Um, but we're optimistic that we can fix that vulnerability uh, and get them re-enabled. One last feature that a lot of folks are talking about and looking forward to is integration with the browser's garbage collection. So today you can ship down your own garbage collector with your code if you want to, but that can be kind of slow for a few different reasons. Uh, and it's hard to integrate with the browser's GC. But the community group is working on making it possible for WebAssembly code to just use the built-in GC. And we expect to see some developments in this over the next year. So unfortunately, that's all I have time to talk about today, uh, except for questions. <laughs> Um, so I will have to wrap it up. But before I do, I want to give a thank you. Um, I had a fantastical collaborator and uh, technical reviewer on this, Luke Wagner. Um, he's the person who came up with the way to make types work in ASM.js, which was the precursor to WebAssembly. And he also did a lot of the work to push WebAssembly forward. Uh, so a big thank you to Luke, and thank you to you all for listening. Thanks. So I think we have time for questions. Yeah. OK. Wanna, does anybody have a question? I have a question. So can I cut in front of you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, also, I, I saw you on like a JS conference. Visit, so it's like this like, new celebrity. I was just wondering. Um, <laughs> so like my brother, like, he does a lot of like development, too. And he said that web is like really hot. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, because like, like changes in like at least the front end not really quick, like with like all the reacts and like all these different things. But if you have a vision, people will start like just hopping onto WebAssembly and rewriting all their like people who you use JS like right now will will have to like just be current. We'll have to learn how to write in Rust and like functional languages just to like be be the top. Do you think that It'll be really soon, like people will need to do that. Okay, so the question is, will front-end developers need to switch over to Rust or learn some Rust or, or other languages like that in the short term um, as, as more projects take it on? I don't actually think so. I think that a lot of what we're going to see is library authors. Like the Ember folks currently are working on um, putting WebAssembly into Ember itself. Now, any users of Ember aren't going to need to know, and probably won't even know unless they watch a conference talk about it, that WebAssembly is being used internally. They're using Rust. Um, so I think that you may need to learn it if you want to work at Facebook on React, or if you want to work on Ember, or on these tools um, where it might be part of the core architecture. But I don't think it's very likely that front-end developers are going to need to learn how to use those languages. Okay. Yeah. I have a question that kind of ties in with him, and I think it's um, interesting. Do you have any recommendations, sorry, my voice, um, do you have any recommendations on small projects or ideas that somebody who's, who's been interested in this can get kind of their hands dirty with either interfacing with it or seeing two different modules, one with and one without, mm -hmm. and be able to get their hands dirty with it in small ideas, right? Right. Nothing, not like trying to dive in and build my own library, right? But like, you know, something so like, like so like maybe is there a module you could just try to access? Well, we actually are going to have. So the the question is, um, is there are there small projects that you can get your hands dirty? Um, yeah. And we actually are going to have something coming up really soon, which will be fun for this. Um, we just confirmed that we have a project at JSConfU. It's a big. Uh, it's actually an artist from Pittsburgh. It's a light environment. Um, let me see if I, I'll pull up his, oh, I don't have internet. It is Ian Brill. Okay, yeah. Uh, oh, well, very cool. Yeah, so um, Ian, uh, we just, we have to work out the contract, so I don't want to promise, but um, we just confirmed that we're going to have the vault um, from uh, Spirit there. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with his work, um, it's basically these corrugated plastic boxes that are like pixels that have LEDs in them. Um, so it's really cool looking. Uh, Ian Brill is the artist's name. Um, and so what we're going to do is use that to uh, highlight the Rust 
to WebAssembly work. Um, you're going to be able to write modules to do things like exploding pixels or stuff like that that will then play on the space. And we're hoping to have like a pipeline where you could take different modules and combine them together for different visual effects. Um, so yeah, I would also say that there's the Rust to WebAssembly a lot. The Rust community is really great. Um, they are uh, spending the next um, few months really focusing on WebAssembly. Um, and so I'd say getting involved with that work could be also really good because I know that um, Nick Fitzgerald, who is the, is it domain group or working group or? Working group, okay, yeah. <laughs> the working group lead for Rust of WebAssembly is doing a lot right now to find those projects and get contributors you know, hooked up with them. Um, so that would be another way. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the perspective I'm coming from and the reason that I'm interested in WebAssembly is uh, not, like, as, not for the web as it's uh, being des uh, explicitly designed for, but as uh, a sort of like, uh, like cross-platform extension uh, like a language for uh, just like general desktop applications. So just like replacing the uh, role of Lua or Python and, and just uh, and, uh, letting you create a cross-platform extensions and letting people like, distribute those without having to commit to a specific uh, scripting language and, uh, and or commit, committing to JavaScript or that sort of, that sort of thing. So do you know what sort of progress is being made to uh, like t uh, take all the uh, work that's been done in, into these uh, browser uh, WebAssembly interpreters and the uh, different pilots and sling them up into their uh, own thing so that they can be used in uh, uh, from languages like Rust or C without having to go through a JavaScript layer? I don't know if there's any active work on that. I know that somebody at Mozilla uh, is really trying to turn that into a project. Um, and he just became the leader of the WebAssembly team in emerging technologies. So it might be a project soon that we have. <laughs> um, but I don't know of any active work at the moment. Um, now, you can, so the Node is talking about having their native modules uh, instead of like using Node JIP for them and uh, actually having those be WebAssembly modules. So they'd be native modules. Um, and that is a discussion that's just happening on Twitter at the moment, but may turn into something soon. <laughs> and, oh. Yes, girl. What are you working on right now or next? <laughs> so I'm working on a few things right now. Um, the question was, what am I working on now or next? <laughs> um, so I mentioned this just briefly in the presentation. Uh, right now, we have a JavaScript API for uh, instantiating one of these modules, uh, a WebAssembly module. Um, but it'd be really nice if you could just have JavaScript ES modules that import WebAssembly modules and just like export and import just works. Um, and so I'm working on um, specifying that uh, through the WebAssembly working group, uh, which also has some crossover work that needs to happen in TC39, which is the JavaScript standards group. Um, so that's the big project right now. Uh, I'm also working on this art installation that I mentioned just now. Um, and I'm also helping out with the Rust to WebAssembly work. Um, so I mentioned in the talk, we have a few projects that, uh, because the Rust folks don't just want to make Rust compile to WebAssembly, they also want to make sure that it's ergonomic for people to use it with JavaScript. Um, so we're working on a pipeline to, that will take you from compiling Rust all the way to bundlers and make sure that that's a smooth um, interaction. Um, so the projects that are involved there are WASM binds gen. So uh, that is, we'll take a WebAssembly module and wrap it in some JavaScript that does all of those type handling things for you as uh, data is going into a function and as data is coming out from a function. Um, then the next thing is uh, a thing that will package up your Rust code, um, or really we're thinking that this will also work for C and C++ um, eventually. Uh, so this will bundle up your uh, WebAssembly code into a package that can go up onto NPM. And then the final step, uh, which is what I'm most involved in, is making sure that bundlers support WebAssembly modules well. So uh, that's things like Webpack, uh, Parcel, Rollup, Browserify. Um, 
So that is what I'm working on currently. Thank you. <laughs> I have well, five minute more questions, that's okay. Um, yeah. I think that you brought an interesting fresh look on, on uh, WebAssembly, but what are your thoughts about pre-existing libraries being brought onto the browser? I think that that's part of the conversation, right? Like something abstract like Unity being able to be kind of like shipped through the browser. Mm -hmm. um, can you uh, talk on that for a second? Cause so Unity, yeah, does currently have WebAssembly support. Um, they were actually one of our big partners in, we had this thing called the games program, um, which is what drove the use case, like uh, the development of Emscripten. That was the use case that they were targeting. Um, and they've actually been hiring away some of our best people recently. So <laughs> um, I think that that is a, a big key to getting adoption and to also understand, knowing whether or not we understand the problems. Um, what we've, sh we're shifting away from focusing on um, games at this point to focusing on web application frameworks. So Ember is an example of that. Um, we are also, we've been talking to the Elm folks, uh, which is more of a language than a, a framework, but, um, you know, Reason at Facebook. Um, we've talked with the React folks. I actually gave a talk about what WebAssembly means for React. Um, that was uh, the result of a discussion I had with Luke Wagner and Sebastian Markbidge, who is uh, one of the main architects of React. Um, so we think that that is the next big thing as far as getting more adoption of WebAssembly. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that there is still compilation and optimization of WebAssembly in the browser. Mm -hmm. and I'd always assumed that was all for time. So what actually happens in the browser? Yeah, so that is, um, there's some trickiness around that because like when you're doing that kind of optimization in the browser, um, it, you don't always know some of the stuff that you know ahead of time, you know, that, um, you know, like you can't do, if you have a lot of small WebAssembly modules, you can't do a lot of the optimizations that you can in a Rust context when you have all of the crates um, and you know about them. Um, so I don't actually know how much the optimizing compiler does, what kinds of optimizations it does, but I do know that we now have a two-tier um, compiler. The baseline compiler is 10 times faster, and it, the code that it produces is only twice as slow. Um, so the optimizing compiler must be doing lots of stuff, <laughs> but I just don't know what, what the optimizations it's making are. Any other questions? Yeah. You said it would be faster like from 20% to 800%. Okay, so I may have a quite similar question to you. Do you think in the future we can like run a big game just using the browser? So actually there are some games that are already running in the browser using WebAssembly. Um, there, uh, I'm trying to think the awesome WASM repo on GitHub probably has a few examples. I would think. I haven't checked, to be honest, but um, that's probably a good place to look. Okay, so like, what kind of application X has a game and do you use a light environment? Like, do, you, do you have anything um, else in the long term? So we've been working with the Photoshop team Photoshop. Um, to run Photoshop in the browser. Um, those are the kind, you know, another example of the kinds of applications that we expect to see. So before, when you were showing a thing, you were saying, like, uh, you get integers. Yeah. It's, so right now, that's a little bit coming in for a lot of uses on the web. But it's, like, pretty low bar, right? Like, it's just right. strings. But then you were talking about maybe DOM access. Right. That's a leap and a half. How did, like, what? Yeah, it is a leap and a half. Like, quantum leap. Like, <laughs> So it's interesting. We thought that DOM access was going to be blocked by garbage collection. Okay. But then Luke Wagner, who I mentioned, he had this really smart idea for something called host bindings. Um, and basically uh, what host bindings will do, well, there, uh, there's another proposal that was part of host bindings that's now been split off. It's the AnyRef proposal. But basically 
any ref. Oh, any ref. So any reference. Okay. Um, you have this. You have tables in WebAssembly where you can like use an integer to point into the table, right. um, and that would just be a table of the DOM. Um, yeah, exactly. Pointers to DOM things, um, and so that's a way of getting around that. Yeah. Um, so the last time I heard, progress was going pretty well on that, and. Um, I'm saying I'm going to guess it's uh, probably happening this year. Wow. So we, you were talking about how it usually takes 10 years for a yeah. standard. The WebAssembly group is amazingly fast. Um, once Luke got the browsers on board, 2015, it was only from 2015 to 2017 for the whole spec. Um, and now, of course, adding more features and stuff like that. Um, but I I have a lot of respect for the way that they've um, that they've gone about this whole process. I think it's also the first spec that had participation of all four browsers from the start. Yeah. Um, so it's really been amazing. It had kind of a lot of like prior art thought. It did, Asm.js, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you had Asm, and then like even before that, you had like the M scripting stuff that was just produced slow JavaScript. Right, <laughs> super slow JavaScript, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think also like pretty early got a bunch of people from games industries mm -hmm. like pretty seriously excited. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I mean it's it, it's been really fast. I don't, I don't mean to say it's not really fast, but also I think it's a little bit not really. 2015, like it, you'd have to start the clock really. 2012, yeah, yeah, 2012 is when you first, I think, have ASM.js. That's when Luke came up with the idea that, you know, you could have this bitwise operator that would indicate types. Um, so, the, yeah, there's three years of the development of ASM.js, which did really basically inform a lot of the specification of WASM. It's true. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's still in. In web speed, that's really fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, and from my experience, they have a really functional working group. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's impressive. Any other questions from anyone? Yeah. I have one more. Um, well, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, C, C++ and Rust are the big communities and the supported ones right now. Are, are, you, are any of the other communities out there trying to get their name into that bin? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of them that are. Um, so Microsoft is, uh, just in this past month, um, has made some official pro um, projects around C Sharp, um, which we'll see how that goes. Like, um, they're going to have some more challenges than other. Um, there's been some work around TypeScript. Uh, basically, you could create a super set of TypeScript that could compile to WebAssembly, and there have been some projects around that, um, and the TypeScript team has actually talked about possibly taking that on as a project. Um, the reason folks have been um, working on um, at least experimenting with it, um, the Elm folks uh, are very interested, and we might be helping out with that effort. Um, so there are a lot of different language communities that are interested. The big blocker right now for a lot of languages is the garbage collection issue. And so we're going to be pushing on that a lot. Why, why is it a superset of TypeScript? What are you, what are you missing? Um, you need more specific number types. Ah, okay. yeah. And I'm not sure you might need other things too, but that's definitely something you need. Any other questions? Yeah. You're, you're generally going to run into problems that you wouldn't have expected to run into when you started uh, working on the project. So, like, can, it, do that. Any of those sort of, sorts of problems stand out in your mind when thinking back to like uh, your work on WebAssembly and like what sort of problems that you run to run into that you solved that you wouldn't have expected that to uh, needed to solve in order to get this working? Hmm. Let me think. So, I haven't actually built a large project in WebAssembly myself. Um, okay, so um, 
One problem that's coming to mind is um, in the ES module specification, um, you can't have cycles between ES, JavaScript ES modules and other kinds of ES modules. There can't be cyclic, uh, cyclic dependencies between them. Um, and that is a problem that people did not foresee. Um, but just because of the way that things are specified, uh, if you have an error when you're loading a non-JavaScript module, it's unclear how you should handle that error. Um, so I, I know that that's a weird one because it's like actually in the specification and not a project um, issue, but it's one that I came up, uh, ran into recently. So it's fresh on the top of my mind. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Is there, uh, so you said some things are enabled, but they kind of are implemented. Is there an experimental Firefox branch we could build? Oh, uh, well, there, you know what? Um, so, Nightlace, yeah. We haven't gotten to the point with any of the features that I've, future features I was talking about where we have flags for them, but we may soon, because um, the ES modules one is probably one that we will have a flag for. Um, the GC one might be one that we have a flag for, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I've gotten very bad at repeating people's questions. I'm sorry about that for anyone on the feed. I hear that you're supposed to wait for an awkward amount of time to get all the questions out. <laughs> yeah, tell me when it's getting awkward. <laughs> Okay, I think that's awkward enough. <laughs> well, thank you all again for coming and for listening. Uh, and if you think of any questions, feel free to shoot them at me on Twitter.